Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your service today. Uh, really excited to be able to join you from snowy Brewster, New York. Uh, Brewster, New York, it's about 45 minutes north of the city. Uh, my home group, as I mentioned, is the Brewster Earlier Birds. We meet at 6 a.m. Eastern time uh, during the week and 7 a.m. on the weekend. So we do meet seven days a week. I do want to start just with kind of a quick prayer that we read at our home group every day, um, just kind of gets me centered. So I hope you will uh, all feel the same way after hearing it. It says, Our Father, we come to you as a friend. You have said that wherever two or three are gathered in your name, there you will be in the midst. We believe you are here with us now, and this is something you would have us do, and that it has your blessing. We pledge with you always to be honest and to search our hearts for weaknesses and errors that we may deserve your help. We believe that you want us to be real partners with you in this business of living, accepting our full responsibilities and certain that the rewards will be freedom, growth, and happiness. For this, we are grateful. We ask you at all times to guide us, to help us daily to come closer to you, granting us new ways of living and of gratitude. Amen. So I'm really grateful to be here um, as I logged on today. This has definitely been two years in the making uh, in terms of scheduling. So I'm just really happy to be here. And, you know, thank you for everybody that have done your service. Uh, my sobriety date is 9-21-2010. Um, I do have a sponsor that is well aware that they are my sponsor, um, which means we speak regularly and we do regular inventory. And I have the uh, really blessing and privilege of working with people through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous as outlined in the big book. Um, and it is a blessing and it is a privilege. Uh, we're going to talk today really about our four step and how it really is a blessing to be on the other side of one of those. So I loved that this meeting had a real focus. Um, when I was asked to speak, it you know talked about picking a step or picking a topic. And um, you know, I'd spent some time thinking about what it was going to be. Um, and then the day that I actually sent over the topic, I had fallen asleep uh, and then responded. And I was like, power of inventory, like talk about God. I woke up and I was like, okay, well, apparently I'm supposed to be talking about inventory. And so here we are. And when I, you know, I love that there are newcomers here. Um, so please do not be discouraged that we're going to be talking about the later steps. Um, it is never too early to start inventory, particularly step 11, which talks or asks us to talk uh, and listen to God. Um, so you don't have to be all the way there to be continuing or starting your relationship there. Um, obviously, your four step and your 10 step requires a relationship with a sponsor, um, but it's never, never, never too early to really be starting to talk to somebody um, other than yourself. If you're counting days and are not convinced yet of God, that's okay. Um, it's just important that you're having a conversation um, with not you and that you're not answering your own questions. Um, I will later know that that becomes God. Um, but when I first come in here, I'm not sure what it is. I just know I'm in so much pain and I've got to be able to move forward. So when I talk about inventory, to me, it means freedom. And sometimes we come into AA and people say, like, how happy do you want to be? Um, you know, for me, the question is, how free do I want to be? And the freedom, right, the sense of peace that I get through doing these 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous really comes through trying to do this work, seeing the truth, understanding the truth. And that comes through the power of inventory, um, I will tell you that I've had plenty of experiences in my four step, 10 step, uh, 11 step. I'm actually going to be quite vulnerable today and walk you through some of those experiences. Uh, for me, I learn better when I have opportunities to hear examples. And so I'm going to share those with you today. Um, and just keep in mind that like what inventory does is it gives me answers to things that I could not explain, right? It gives me answers to why I'm blocked, why I'm frustrated why I'm mad at people, right? All the things that I didn't really think were manifestations of my alcoholism. Um, I came into AA convinced that this was really just like an emergency room. I wanted to come in here. I wanted to clean up. Um, I had no intentions of stopping drinking altogether. Um, I wanted to be like the women on Sex in the City and drink like really pretty drinks and get dressed up. And I crack PBR cans on my head at dive bars in the Bronx. And so that kind of tells you the kind of drinker I am. Today, we're really going to focus on four 
um, 10 and 11 really as the inventory pieces, but wanted to spend some time sort of qualifying or kind of how I got to that spot. I am going to be referring to the big book today a little bit. So if you've got your book in front of you, please feel free to follow along. And if not, that's okay too. So I came to AA uh, on 921 2010 I actually had come in a year before. Um, I relapsed for about a year. Um, I couldn't quite put time together. And then finally, I found somebody armed with the facts. Um, and she so very politely said to me, um, I care more about your life and less about your feelings. And so we're going to go ahead and go through these 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. I did not pick her. Uh, she picked me. Uh, I think sometimes we spend a lot of time thinking about like, who our sponsor is going to be. Uh, I made worse choices dating people, which is a pretty big part of our life. And yet somehow or other, you know, when I get this question about picking a sponsor, I'm like, what are they like? What's their sign? Are they qualified? Are they qualified to sponsor me? Like, what kind of question is that, right? The qualification is, do they have an experience with the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and are able to get me through those steps? Now, it looks like obviously not a winning streak, not a single person comes to AA because life is good, right? I mean, nobody wakes up and is like, you know where I'm going to be? In a basement full of people smoking cigarettes and trying to find God, right? I came here because I was battered and bruised and broken, and I didn't know where else to go. And as I mentioned, I wasn't really sure I wanted to give up drinking. I just knew that I didn't want to live the life that I had been drinking, <laughs> And so I can qualify that a thousand different ways. I can tell you a thousand different stories about what my drinking looks like. But if we turn to page 44, that's really all that you need to know about me, right? It says, if when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely, I'm at the first paragraph, or if when drinking, you have little control over the amount you take, you are probably alcoholic. And really, that's how simple it is. Now, I believe we all got there differently, right? Maybe you went to detox, maybe you went to rehab, maybe you lost a family, maybe you don't have a family, whatever it is, right? The truth is, is for me, once I start drinking, I can't stop. And once I'm drinking, I have little control over the amount I take. I'm the kind of drinker that gets anxious at an open bar. Um, I have a big Irish family, and I go to events where I think the alcohol is going to run out. Uh, if you are part of a big Irish family, the alcohol does not run out. Uh, but I have the fear that it's going to run out. So I am stealing wine and hiding alcohol underneath a table at a party with my family because I'm afraid I'm not going to have enough alcohol. That's it. I start drinking. I kick off this phenomenon of craving and I can't stop. When I came into AA and I saw this thing about life being unmanageable, I thought, sure, like I lose my shoes and I throw up on people and I get into bar fights and like that's pretty unmanageable, right? It's pretty much of a mess. It's important that we understand the difference between consequences and unmanageability. I put a drink in my mouth and I have these consequences, which is the fighting and the losing the shoes and not going home with the person I went to the bar with. But that's a story for a different day, right? It's like I'm just on to the next thing. And what I've got to remember is the unmanageability is actually that I continue to take the drink even though I don't want to, right? I continue to take a drink even though I know I'm going to turn into this monster and all these things happen. And that's the unmanageability that I can't manage. I cannot manage the choice between drinking or not drinking. And that first step really is not about like when I'm going to drink again, right? Or if I'm going to drink again, it's when I'm going to drink again. I need something to come in and rearrange my thinking and help me. When I got to that second step, right? And as we continue through this inventory, it's important to understand like we need a relationship with God, right? And I came in here not having a relationship with God. On the outside, things looked okay. I had convinced myself that if I had a job and an apartment and things that I couldn't be an alcoholic. Uh, in 2008, at the height of my drinking, I decided I shouldn't be drinking anymore. Uh, and like any other human being, I decided to run the New York City Marathon in order to prove to the world that I could not be an alcoholic because it's absolutely impossible to run a marathon and be an alcoholic. Well, I'm here to tell you and save you 26.2 miles. You can absolutely run a marathon and still be an alcoholic. And I've just spent my whole life running, physically running, mentally running, emotionally running. And then in the end, I always get caught. And so when I'm told to come in here, right, and find God, and it says like, you know, find God or die an alcoholic death, I literally say to my sponsor, like, how painful is the alcoholic death? I'm like, if I get hit by a bus, it's like pretty painless, right? I'm just going to, I won't even remember it. But is it going to be long and drawn out? Because when given those two things, I'm so afraid, right? Even though my life has zero evidence that it's going well, 
the idea that I've got to give it over to something else is really, really scary for a person like me who likes to be in control. That's why I drink because I've got all these noise going on and all these things going on and I drink to get out of that. And here's the thing, like me, I would get to the bar, right? I, I, I was in college at the height of my drinking and uh, we used to put red solo cups into garbage cans and like whatever was in the garbage can, right? Whatever kind of alcohol it was, I just put my red cup into that garbage can and I asked no questions. And so I just want you to think back on your drinking career and just sort of say like, how many times did I just take something and somebody said, it's going to make you feel better. And I took it and I took it without asking any questions because I was desperate to feel better. And then I come into AA and somebody says, do these steps, get to God. It's going to make you feel better. And I'm like, how long is that going to take? Like, is that, that's kind of inconvenient. I, you know, I think that's going to get in the way. And why I say that is because if you come in like me struggling with this idea of God, what it shows me is I have the power and ability to have a blind faith the same way I put that cup into the garbage can to make me feel better. And that's that second step. My favorite thing is when people are saying I'm working on step two, I'm like, what are you working on? Right. It's really just a simple question. Like, do you believe in God or are you even willing to believe in God? If you've got your book in front of you, I'm just going to ask you to flip to page 52 where the bedevilments are. And this is me, right? Most likely it could also be you, right? We're not here to judge anybody else, but this is the problem when I come into Alcoholics Anonymous. It's not that I've got a drinking problem. It's got, it's that I'm maladjusted to life. Trouble with personal relationships. I can't control my emotional nature. Prey to misery and depression. Can't make a living. Feeling of uselessness. Full of fear. Unhappy. Can't be helpful to other people. I'm riddled with that. Right, Our nine-step promises are obviously going to offset that. And then it tells me to find God, right? Deep down inside every single man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. The biggest joke of AA is I have looked everywhere else for God, literally everywhere else. Every self-help book you can imagine, every retreat, every relationship, every bank account. And guess what? It's been inside me the whole time, the whole time. I just never looked there, right? Deep down inside all of us is this fundamental idea of God. I'm blocked. And this is how we get to this point of inventory, right? Got to recognize that why I can't access this thing inside of me is because I am blocked. I've got too much stuff that's in the channel that I can't get to it. It's actually there, right? It talks about we've got to concede to our innermost self that we are alcoholic. For me, the same exact spot that I make the concession is the same exact time I make permission for something to come into my life. The concession becomes permission. Once I realize I've got defeat, I need something else. I need something else to come in and help me. I'm going to share a little bit about this more as I go through inventory, but I want to share that I had this major block in my life. Uh, 921, 2001, if you listen to my sobriety date, they are the same date a couple of years before. I was brutally assaulted in New York City and basically left in a hotel room to die. And I share that because I believe that a lot of us have something and you can take a moment to think about what your something is. Maybe it's something similar to mine or whatever your thing may be. But these are the things that block us. And this was the thing that did not allow me to get to God. I felt separated from people. I felt separated from God. And all I could say to myself is like, where was God then? Right now, I later would learn, like, I get out of that hotel room and I become something else, but I can't see it in the moment. And when it talks about being blocked by the ugliness of the trees, like, that was it. I was blocked by that piece. And so I realized, like, you just got to be 51% more willing to move forward than you are to stay still. And if you were someone that raised your hand and said you're counting days, like, that 1% is a very powerful 1% because you don't have to be all in at this point. You just got to be more willing to move forward than you are to stand still. And that's really what that third step is before we get to that fourth step inventory. Like, am I convinced that I'm blocked? Am I convinced that I can no longer make decisions for myself? Am I convinced that I've got to quit playing God? Am I convinced that the way that I'm living is not working? Am I convinced that I've littered enough on my life and the people in it, then I need something else to come in. And so I take that third step, right? Realize the bondage of self. I ask for a new manager. I sign my line on the contract really at the end of those ABCs, right? I say something else has to come in. And then I think, well, that was pretty good, right? 
And then it says this, it says, it's going to have little permanent effect unless immediately followed by a house cleaning. I'm like, uh, hello, were you just present for the first three things? Like, I didn't believe in God and now I'm willing to, like, isn't that enough work? And I remember when I first came in and I looked at those steps and I looked at that four step and I thought, well, like, that's a nice step, right? It's kind of nice to think about that, but it's not going to be the one that I'm going to do. I was so afraid to look at the things that were blocking me. I was absolutely terrified by the things that I said, I will never tell anybody I did those things, right? I will never share these things with people. I will never tell them. And so there are several references to inventory throughout the 12 steps. I just want to be clear that they all serve a very similar purpose, right? We're going to make a list. We're going to ask God to help us understand the truth or see the truth in this list, and then we're going to ask God to remove what you've seen. And whether that's happening in your four step or your 10 step or your 11 step, like that's what's happening there. And like the title of this meeting, we're going to get rid of those things, right? We're going to subtract them. Some people will say things like, you know, I've got to learn more patience or I need God. I'm going to ask God for honesty. And I'm like, you're actually going to ask God to make sure you're not dishonest. And then the addition of that is you're going to become honest. But I actually can't be trusted with dishonesty or honesty. So I ask God to put me in this place of neutrality, which is what my 10 step is going to do. But this initial inventory that we're going to take in step four is going to continue. And it's just going to help me see the truth. And to me, that's where the freedom is. Because even though, and I'm sorry to tell you, you're not going to like everything you see in these inventories. But that's where the growth is. That's where the freedom is. Right? Every single time I thought everybody else was the problem. My mom's the problem. My job's the problem. Blah, blah, blah. Everybody else is the problem. Well, the good and bad news is like, the bad news is I'm the problem. But the good news was the entire universe didn't need to change. Because I was pretty convinced that everybody else had a lot of work to do to live the way that I wanted them to live. And so the first time I get to this four step, we're gonna kind of, I just want to kind of run through like a brief what we're doing. Four step immediately after three, right? Telling us that our third step has little permanent effect unless immediately followed by this housekeeping or really to find out what's blocking us. 10 step, also known as what we call a spot check inventory. You take it throughout the day. Maybe you take it many times throughout the day. Maybe you take it all day, right? The idea is that I continue to do it as it happens, as it's happening, and quickly turn that over. And then the 11 step is really taken at day's end. We bring it into our morning meditation. And that's really what we're going to focus on today. The power of these tools, these resources, to see the truth and get to the road of freedom. Because I wanted to kill myself when I came into AA. And I was too coward to do it. Yet what I've gotten here, the greatest gift is a sense of peace and a sense of freedom. The world and its people no longer dominate me. They occasionally do. I'm not going to promise you that never happens. They occasionally do. But I've got these tools to help me. So I sit down. I start to write this four step. Right? We talk about liquor is but a symptom. Right? It's really just kind of hovering over all the actual problems I have in my life. And I start writing, right? It's fact, it talks about fact finding and fact facing. If you work in a business where you do inventory, you count things, you throw out what doesn't work, right? It's pretty much that simple. What we don't like to see in our four step, it says the flaws in our makeup. Well, yeah, again, we want to blame everybody else. We think everybody, it's my first grade teacher. She didn't call on me. I mean, really, like I remember my first grade teacher, I was like mad at her for like not calling on me. This is how sick I can be, right? It's like, I hold on to these things. They're the problem but it actually talks about the flaws in our makeup. And we talk about this idea of resentment as the number one offender. And I have seen this, unfortunately. I just have seen it with somebody very close in my life recently. And he had pulled together some time and he went out. And the first thing I said was, where was your resentment? And he was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I said, Let, let's look at that. And we were able to get to this place where he was resentful six months, seven months before he actually took the relapse. I said to him, your relapse actually ended when you put the drink to your mouth. The resentments, the fears, the insecurities, all of that was brewing so far ahead of time. And as an alcoholic, the only thing that's going to make you feel better in that moment is taking something to numb that out, which in this case was alcohol. So this is what it means when I got to get down to causes and conditions, right? Resentment it, from it, form all, all forms of spiritual disease come from resentments. 
And I still wanted to drink when I got to my first four step. And I share that because one of the most important things it says is once the spiritual malady is overcome, then you straighten out mentally and physically. So it was okay to still be thinking about drinking at this point. It wasn't going to come until I got to the point where I got into a little bit more of a spiritual connection, which for this alcoholic happened in eight and nine. So I'm going to walk you through a four step. Again, this is like pure vulnerability. I'm going to share with you some of my own experiences, kind of a little bit of a workshop and kind of what does it look like? So we get to this four step, right? And if you've got your book in front of you, you can sort of follow along with some of the, some of the things there, which really starts on page 64. My experience with the four step is we're going to have four lists with four columns. Um, in some cases, maybe you've got a fifth column. I'm, I'm not here to be the debating society about, yes, you got to need to have a fifth column or no, you don't, right? I'll save that between you and your own God. What I know with the power of a fifth column sometimes does is it helps us to see the truth, right? I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into this work. You're going to have a list of resentments, fear, sex harms, and then a harms other than sex list, right? So four lists, four columns, that's what you're looking at. Now, again, resentment, like I remember my sponsor saying to me, like, write down all the people you're angry at. I'm like, I love this place. I love AA. I can't wait to do this activity. Like, great. What I didn't know was what resentment, and this happened later on, fourth steps, right? It actually means to refuel. So maybe you've got somebody in your life and you're not actually angry at them or you don't realize that you're angry at them. But every time they come across your mind, you just feel something. You're not even sure what it is that you feel, right? It's just, you know that you feel something and you feel frustrated by it. And that's the sort of things that end up on our fourth step inventory. I will share with you, I had everything, obviously, from my parents to teachers along the way, to skinny people, to skinny people that didn't try. I mean, really, like, I'm sick. I'm sharing with you. Like, I thought these people, like, I've got a friend, God love her. She eats whatever she wants and never gains a pound. And, you know, sober now, 13 years, God has very lovingly given me a husband who has the same, what I consider defect, by the way, right? He gets to eat whatever he wants, never gains a pound. And I'm resentful at that. And I got to look at those things, right? So these are the types of things that are on my inventory. We write down an inventory and then we go across. And so that first column, I start to write the people that I'm resentful at. And the second column is all about being concise. And, you know, we are like to talk. Most of our talking is about trying to justify. So I sit in that second column and I like want to write about all the things that are wrong with my mom. But the truth is, is between, you know, 10 and 19 words, which is the example of the cause in the big book, it really should be that concise. I'm trying to get down to the causes and conditions, not all the other things. And then I move over, right, that third column, and we talk about affects my. And I just want to kind of define some of this, because I do think it's important that we understand what we're looking at in that third column. Right. So pride, self-esteem, ambitions, financial security, personal security, and then my personal and sexual relations. Pride is how I want the world to see me. Right. I want you to think that I'm funny and I've got it together and I all these things. Right. How many resentments in my life impact my pride? Self-esteem is how I feel about myself. My ambitions are what I want for myself. Financial security. Right. Being free from all the things that run me around material things, money personal security. <clears throat> Most of the time we tend to think about personal security in terms of like, was I safe? That's absolutely true in this one. The other thing is like my mind, right? So I may have a resentment for somebody that like, I don't feel physically threatened by, but they take up so much damn space in my mind that it is absolutely impacting my personal security because I think about it all the time. It's blocking me all the time. So just kind of a variation there when we're talking about that. And then, of course, like my personal relationships and my sexual relations. And a really big misconception is what's impacting my sexual relations. We tend to kind of lean towards this idea that it's things that have happened in my sexual relationships. But there is a variation there, too. Right. So if I'm with somebody who has children, perhaps. Right. I did not have a relationship with those children in terms of a sexual relationship, but I could have run around and done terrible things to that partner that has absolutely impacted those children and the other people in that life that it has to end up there when we look at those sexual relations. And really, that's what that entire third column is. And really, if you're an alcoholic like me, I'm like, I love column one. Like, I get to write about everybody else. I love column two. I get to talk about why I'm angry at everybody else. 
poor me is all about the third column, right? Like I get to talk about me, like my feelings, me, 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 like this is great. And then the kicker, right? Fourth column, it's going to show me the truth. What it actually does is take everything in that second column and turn it into a lie. So everything that I've been telling myself this entire time, the re- the re- uh, the foundation of all of those resentments is really going to get debunked in that fourth column. And this is where the freedom is. Because I've been carrying around these things for so long, I put on a new set of glasses, right? Ask me, are you entirely ready to look at this thing differently? And in that, I get to see the truth. Where am I selfish, self-seeking, dishonest, fearful, inconsiderate? I think we sort of know what selfishness is. Self-seeking, probably one of my favorites, a little bit harder to understand. I describe it as, where do I literally look for myself in a situation? So for example, if I've been telling myself my entire life that I am a victim of a sexual assault, I guarantee you that I look for that in every single situation that happens here on out. Somebody says something, I say, well, it's because of this. Look what happened to me, right? I literally look for myself in the situation. Dishonesty could obviously be stealing. If you've got a little bit of time and you're doing a four-step, most of the time, the dishonesty also now comes down to not seeing the truth, right? Failing to see the truth. And the one that I really hate the most, ignoring the truth. You ever get that feeling in your gut and God is like, hello. And you're like, uh, goodbye. I'm not listening to that, right? Like that's the kicker, much more subtle as you start to put a little bit of time together. I want to share with you some of the things that I add to my inventory. I think that they're important. Uh, These are not necessarily in black and white in the book, but it talks about driven by a hundred forms. And I want to share with you in my own vulnerability, what those forms are. Expectations. When I have my sponsees do that fourth column, I ask them, where did you have expectations? So much of my life is wanting to people to behave as the way I want them to, right? Which is just another way of selfishness. And they're often unrealistic right? This is where I start to play God. You know what I think you should do, right? I send you something. I expect you to send it back to me. These are the expectations I have for people. And then when you don't do them, you're like whistling away. That person has moved on, but I'm still annoyed and frustrated that they didn't do what I want them to do. Part of it is asking, where do I have expectations for the world? Where am I playing God? Old ideas into new situations, a very subtle one. This is basically, what's the story you tell yourself? Are you not smart? Are you not funny? Are you not good enough? Did you grow up with something, right, that you basically take into every situation that has blocked you from other people? Have you ever, maybe you've got a learning disability and always thought, you know, people have told you you're never going to amount to something. Well, you know, I don't know how that shows up. I refuse to take certain jobs. I don't want to speak in public. I get nervous, right? It's like all of these things that I've been telling myself are old ideas that I bring into new things 10, 15, 20 years later. Another form of dishonesty. I fail to see the actual truth of what it is. And it's so important that I look at this in my four-step inventory because I have been telling myself a story for years and years and years that it will just continue to block me from other people and most importantly from God. The other thing is I attach meaning where meaning doesn't exist. And I'll share this in terms of an example. Um, I have a very large staff, um, probably anywhere between 20 to 30 people that report to me throughout my career. And I had this gentleman who reported to me and he was always late, always late, like perpetual lateness. And I would say to myself, right, because I have this attaching meaning to where it doesn't exist and these old ideas, I would say it's because I'm a woman right? Because I have been victimized in the past. My immediate thought is everybody's trying to get over on me. Look at him. Who does he think he is? If I was a male, he would never do blah, 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 on and on and on. And then what happens is I look at this and what I realize is like this guy, I I confront him. I just say to him, Hey, I'd like to have a better understanding about why you're late. And what he shows a little bit of kind of what shows up my 10 step. And he says, I actually have been kicked out of my house and I've been taking my bike to the school gym so I can take a shower. Right. And if I don't pause to actually be willing to see the truth, all of this old meaning that I told myself has now created an entire story about this guy that is not real. And it's just one more way that I'm blocked from him as my employee and then God around me. And the final thinking is like exaggerated all or nothing thinking. If you drank like me, your thinking is like me and it is like all or nothing. 
And so something happens, somebody does something, and I think that's what they're going to do forever and forever and forever, right? You wrong me once, you're going to wrong me forever. What that tells me is like, I'm blocked from forgiving people and seeing the truth. And so the power of this step, right, is being able to look at some of these resentments, look at these things. I will share an example kind of all the way through my four step. Obviously, my mother, surprise, surprise, was on my four step. And I was frustrated by the fact that she stayed with my dad after some challenges in their relationship. And I held that resentment for a very long time because my expectations were she should have, she should have, right? When I start saying she should or he should, I'm already in trouble. And what my four step allowed me to see in that final column was that my mother did the best that she could with what she had. Now, imagine carrying a resentment for 20 years and the freedom the absolute freedom to see God's child as she is. I mean, think about it. I've been carrying that around forever and ever and ever. I made this abusive situation that my mother survived about me. Now, that, the power of that freedom is almost, it, it's, un, it's crazy, right? These are things we carry with us. I was able to apply that same thinking with my dad and make a great side amends. Obviously, I get to my four step, I put on there the people that assaulted me. And my first sponsor says, you know, you did nothing in that you were drugged, we're going to move on. And I think, okay, a couple months go by, a couple things go by. And all of a sudden, I want to drink. And there's a warning, right tells us like, if we are not thorough and honest, we may drink again. And this is my example to you of how that showed up. I'm in a meeting, probably at my eighth and ninth step at this point, And I turn to the guy next to me and I say, I want to drink. And he's like, what? I'm like, I'm out of here. I hate this place. I hate you all. Like, I'm, I'm over it. And I go home and I start thinking about drinking. And there's a knock on the door. And it's him. And I was like, what are you doing here? He said, there's something you missed on your four step. This is where I talk about, like, he was a guy. I was a woman. I know there might be some things about women with the women, men with the men. But if I was not open to working with this gentleman at the time he knocked on my door, I probably wouldn't be sitting here with you. He says, let's go back to your four step. And somewhere between punching him in the face and letting him in the door, like there we were, and we were working on this. And what I learned in that moment, in this, this thing that had happened to me, think about your thing, if you've got one, was even though I had no control over the thing that happened to me, I had spent the next 10 years of my life hurting people, harming people, pushing them away, making excuses, living as a victim. And that absolutely was my fault. No control over what happened, but how would I live my life as a result of what happened? So sometimes we've got some really big things on this four-step inventory. And I just ask people, is it possible that we can put the thing on the shelf, the thing we couldn't control, and spend some time looking at the things that we could control? And while I had not assaulted anybody in the way that somebody had assaulted me, I could look at the defect of taking things that weren't mine, abusing my power, wanting what I wanted when I wanted, and most importantly, not caring about anybody that I may hurt as a result of my action. We all living in character defects. We just fall on the different spectrum of where those things are. And that freedom and that ability to look at what happened to me differently has allowed me to take things in my life and, and be helpful with them. I go through that, continue through those resentments, fears, right? What am I afraid of? Same, same idea, sex harms, the people in my life and my sexual relations that I've harmed. Reminder, talks about needing an overhauling here. You know, no judgment, but I definitely need an overhauling, not just like a little cleanup, like I need an overhauling here. And there's some really great pieces of advice in that four-step inventory about it. Talks about when sex is troublesome, we throw ourselves the more into helping others. Uh, there was a point in time I had 13 sponsees and somebody would say, why do you have so many sponsees? I would say, when sex is troublesome, we throw ourselves the more into helping others, right? That's the solution there. When I'm struggling with this part of my life, I am to help other people. So I come out of this four-step inventory, and I've got some powerful things at my hand, right? What it's going to give me is really this list of things that I'm going to take into six and seven. It's also going to give me the foundation for steps eight and nine. Um, so please don't burn it. Um, I've heard of some people going to a holy mountain and burning their four step. You're actually going to need it for your eighth and ninth step. And this is also the step that's going to give me my the sick man prayer. And what I love so much about the sick man prayer, it says, pray for those people. 
And what I think is like, I'm not praying for those people, but it actually talks about God save me from being angry because they are sick. Spoiler alert, like me. It's like, I only, I only get to the part where it says those people are sick, right? Those people that assaulted me are sick, like me. And to be sick is unconscious, unaware, or wounded, right? So do I come across people that are just not aware? Do I come across people that don't have conscious contact with God? And do I come across people that hurt, have hurt, and so therefore they hurt people? Wounded people hurt people, not necessarily intentionally, but they're not conscious enough and may not have a relationship with God. And so when I say that sick man prayer, it's God save me from being angry, because if I'm angry, I can't get to you and I can't get to God. So I go through six and seven, go through eight and nine. We sort of summed up our four step inventory and we move into what looks like our 10 step inventory where it says continue to take. And it says continue to take because it assumes that we did it in the four step. And really what step 10 asks me is, can we stay sober, keep in good balance and live in good purpose under all conditions, all of them, every single one of them, all the things in our life. Can I stay sober, remain in good balance and be purposeful in all of those questions? It says to continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. And again, I'm not part of the debate society. I know some people are like, those are the only four you're looking for. But if you're sick like me, I also add all the other ones, the expectations, the attaching meaning where it doesn't exist, all of those things that run me around every single day. I have a hundred forms of every single defect and and they're breeding every day. They're causing more. They're showing up in many different ways. If you can, for a second, just turn to page 84. I want to just look at the steps of the 10 step inventory. Um, And really, this is going to show you where we get this idea of a day at a time. I come into AA and they talk about a day at a time. And I'm like, there's no, how do I do that? Well, 10 step is actually going to show me how to do that. Continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. When these crop up, we ask God at once to remove them. We discuss them with someone immediately and make amends quickly if we've harmed anyone. Then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone who can help. Love and tolerance of others is our code. We basically do four through 12 just in our 10 step, right? I see what's wrong. I ask God to remove it. I turn if I need to make amends. And again, just because I I learned through examples, I'm going to show you what this looks like in my life today. My now husband, um, he worked in construction and he was working on this job that I felt was taking way too much. I felt, you can already see where this is going, guys. I felt like he was taking too much time with this job. And we're at the grocery store one night and I'm hungry and I want to eat and I want everything to go the way I want it to go. And he decides to take this construction call. I'm already resentful about it. And so he now is in the grocery store on about this thing. And I'm at the deli counter and I'm annoyed. And I turn to this random guy next to me and I say, what do you want for dinner? Because I don't think this guy's getting off the phone anytime soon. And I think I'm funny and I think I'm cute and I think I'm all these things. I get back in the car and immediately, immediately, just like it says, I turn to God and I hear it right away. Like your sarcasm is a clear character defect. It is not cute, it is not funny, and you hurt people. Now, what I want to do is call my girlfriend who's going to say, he did what? He's not paying attention to you? Like, this is not the time you call that friend. You turn to God first. I hear the truth. God tells me my sarcasm is a problem. I get home. I make amends for my behavior. I make amends for that sarcasm can be hurtful. I ask about cooking dinner. We eat it. And that's how it shows up in my life today. I can't carry that for the rest of the day. I got to do it in the moment. And that sarcasm, again, is like such a defect that we tend to overlook. What my sarcasm is, is just a way of telling the truth without being afraid of telling the truth, right? I get to hide behind those things. One of the biggest warnings in step 10 is it talks about alcohol as a subtle foe, right? We let up on our laurels. Maybe you've got time. So at this point in my sobriety, alcohol is not the character. uh, Alcohol is not the subtle foe, but my character defects are the subtle foe. And those are the things that start happening a couple minutes late from work. I don't pick up the phone when the sponsee calls, right? These are the things. What step 10 promises me is it places me in a position of neutrality. I am no longer fighting the world and its people. More importantly, one of my sponsors said, I am no longer a victim, but I am no longer the perpetrator. I'm not impacted by other people's behavior, and I'm not causing the pain of the behavior. I'm completely neutral to it which by the way, is something I add in my third step prayer every day. 
God help me be neutral to the day and the activities you're about to bring me. What I see in that 10 step basically sets the foundation for my 11 step inventory, right? Doing it throughout the day now is going to become as I continue to build this relationship with God. And it starts at night. Um, I think sometimes there's a bit of a misconception about my 11 step inventory happening in the morning, right? We get quiet, but it actually starts at night. Uh, And if you turn to page 86, those are the questions that some people ask in their nightly inventory, right? Right in the middle of the second paragraph, was I resentful? Do I owe an apology? Have we kept something to ourselves? Should we discuss something? Were we kind and loving? Uh, Were we thinking of ourselves? Are we thinking of what we could do for others or pack into the stream of life? Now, the biggest gift you can give yourself is to put aside everything you think you know about prayer and meditation. I used to think it had to be a certain amount of time in a certain place with a certain book, with a certain candle. And, you know, when the world was all on Zoom, I would hear somebody read from a book and I'm like, that's the one that that's going to be the one. And I'm like already Amazoning and getting it shipped to my house the next day. Right. It's like, here's the truth. Praying and meditating. As long as you're making the time to do it. I just want to go back to the beginning when I started with doesn't matter if you're counting days. Like, it's important that you still create that time to talk and listen to God, no matter where you are. So I start every night asking these questions. There was a point in my time where I read them right from the book. Today, I ask myself basically three questions every night. What could I have done differently today? That usually helps me to see where I was selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, all those things. I ask, was I helpful? Was there something today that I did that was helpful, knowing that my life depends on being helpful? Have I done that? And even more importantly, was I helpful when nobody was watching? It is so easy to say, I've got X amount of sponsees, and I can do this, and I can do that, and I know this page. It actually means nothing until I'm doing all of those things and practicing these principles. And can I every day at least say I did one thing That's only between God and I, because that's really how we practice these principles in all of our affairs. I remember one time I was, I was at a meeting and this woman walked and her grocery bags were like broken. And so I got out of the car and I gave her one of my bags and my sponsee at the time was like, I saw you give her her bag. And I was like, well, now you just ruined like part of my inventory. Like I wanted that to be the one that nobody saw, but like, am I an example of AA all the time, even when nobody is watching? And that's what that nightly inventory helps me do. So now I've gone through the day. I've got defects like sarcasm. I see those things in my nightly inventory. And then I actually finish that second part of the 11 step, which is in the morning. We ask God to direct our thinking, right? The best part is like, I wake up with an entire plan before my foot even hits the floor. And it's not the plan that I have, right? It's not the plan that God has for me. And it asks that it divorce me from all the things essentially that I've seen in my 10th step and in my 11th step. And that's what it's asking me to do is to sit in meditation, ask God to remove those things. And the most powerful part of our 11th step is it says, and the power to carry it out. If you're bringing all of your things to God, I promise you, you're going to hear things that you think are the wrong answer. There have been times where I'm in meditation and I literally open my eye, like one eye, and I'm like, I think that was meant for my husband. Like maybe we're meditating at the same time. (laughs) And I think that direction was supposed to be for him. I'm like, you want me to do what? Right. And then I sit in meditation more and I pray for it more because we pray for the strength to carry it out. And if I can't hear God in my meditation, I always say to people, is it possible that your voice is louder than God's? Like, could it be that simple that you cannot hear God because you're so loud and you're so in control that you can't hear anything else? And oftentimes I'm blocked when I've got an amends I don't want to make, a defect I'm not willing to give up. I'm not praying. I'm not meditating. I'm in a relationship I shouldn't be. And one of the things that really blocks me is that God has told me something before and I have chosen to ignore it. And I continue living in it, even though it's in pain and even though it's not working. My character defects are literally sleeping overnight, right? That's why it starts at night. I recognize them at night and I've got to take care of them in the morning. And this also then, of course, like feeds my third step, talks about relieve me of the bondage of self. Every morning it's, I care too much what people think. I attach meaning where meaning doesn't exist. 
I've got a story I tell myself. I ask God every day, God, please remove the story I've been telling myself so that I may be helpful to you and other people. Our prayers can really be that simple. We can like overly complicate this, right? Again, it's like, it's 11 minutes, it's seven minutes, it's on my knees, it's in this chair, it's with sage burning, no sage, like it doesn't matter. I just want you to realize like taking the time to do it is important. And all of those things, our four step, our 10 step, our 11 step, are all helping us to see the truth, feel the truth, which ultimately brings us to the place of freedom. Today, I see these things in myself and I literally can laugh at myself. I'm like, I know what this is. Like, I'm jealous. I'm annoyed, right? Ask God to remove it and then we move on. And I've got a little over two minutes. I just kind of want to recap what's happening here and kind of close it together with a summary. It's not easy. Doing this process is not always easy. It's important to have a sponsor. It's important to have somebody armed with the facts. This is what we talk about, a blessing and a privilege. I have heard many four-step inventories in my time being sober. Every single one of them have been a privilege and a blessing. And I have heard things that I may or may not have agreed with. And the power of a 10-step placing me into neutrality allows me to show up to these things with absolutely no opinion. Because the journey that somebody else has gone on, I'm in no position to judge that. And I ask God to come in and help me see the truth about it. I've been privileged to help other people that have been assaulted by doing inventory and getting to that place of freedom. I come into AA spiritually broken, right? That's the truth. It's not about the drinking. I'm spiritually broken. And then I get to meet people along this journey who are also spiritually broken. And then I do inventory and we allow the spiritual brokenness in me to speak in the spiritual brokenness in you. And together with God and AA, we become usefully whole. AA is the only place on earth that I can take the things that I've wanted to kill myself about, that I wanted to drink over and become useful to somebody else. And inventory allows me to do that. And I will just end with, again, if you remember the date of my sobriety, it's 9-21-2010, with my assault happening on 9-21-2001. And I had to relapse all those times so those dates could match up. Because the day that I should have died becomes the day I get my life again through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. The very thing that was blocking me, I get free from by doing inventory and continuing to do it every day. And so wherever you are in your sobriety, maybe you've got lots of time and you're struggling with character defects. Maybe you've got one day and you're not even sure what's going on. I guarantee you that freedom is there through the 12 steps and by taking the action. And remember that that spiritual brokenness eventually makes us all very, very whole. That's my time. And thank you for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.